we know what the problems are with the Packers receiver position. The big hole that the Packers have to fill. Maybe two spots could be taken up by receivers the Packers add this offseason. But what other places, maybe sneaky places, do the Packers have some playing time? How much playing time is potentially at stake in 2022? We dig into that. Plus, Pro Football Focus's Austin Gale is here to offer us a ton of great draft insight. You are Locked On Packers. Your daily Green Bay Packers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Two. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how. And thanks to those who make Locked On Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. I got this great question from Matt on Twitter. And it was about, you know, he wanted a breakdown of where the Packers positionally had opportunities to play this season. So how much is your third edge going to play relative to, let's say, your third interior defensive lineman, relative to your second inside linebacker, relative to your third safety. We talk about some of these backup positions. But what do they actually look like? What does it actually mean? What does it all mean, Basil? That is what I wanted to dig into today. Before we get to our friend Austin Gale, who's been on the show before from Pro Football Focus, um, he and Mike Renner do a, a great podcast that you should check out. Great work being done over a pro football focus, especially around draft time. One of the reasons that I really like their draft content is it is all steeped in data. It's all steeped in what has worked before and what is translatable. What has, what is an indicator of future success? I'm constantly looking for those. It's why I love things like dominator. It's why I like breakout age. I'm constantly trying to find things to, to to set my sights on. What am I looking for here? What are the traits? What is the productivity markers? So we'll have Austin on in a little bit. This, this was a, an interesting project to take on because I found some interesting things, as, as potentially unexpected things. So let's start here. The Packers play 11 personnel, so three receivers. One tight end, one running back. 61% of the time. Right bang on league average. So, if you have Alan Lazard and you have Randall Cobb and you have Amari Rodgers, you've got two guys that can play the slot, one guy that can play the boundary. That's it. So, you need at least one, if not two more boundary receivers because Juwan Winfrey is, is not someone that you can rely on right now that we have seen. Being really good in OTAs or mini camps, not the same as being reliable on the field. Now, I thought he did some nice things in that Arizona game. He also had some big mistakes. Same in the Detroit game. So the lights right now might be a little too bright for him. You hope that with a little bit more playing time, a little bit more experience, maybe he gets his feet under him. I'm I'm not going to hold my breath, and I don't think the Packers are either. So there are probably two spots. I think the Packers are probably going to take two receivers, even if adding a veteran is potentially in the plan unless they make the big swing. You get a DK, a Terry McLaurin, someone like that, then it's find complementary pieces and and figure out exactly what you need to make this offense work with the pieces that you have. If you get Scary Terry, maybe you look at a different kind of player. Maybe you want Traylon Burks a little bit more. If you get DK Metcalf, maybe you want Chris Olave a little bit more. It's all about making the pieces fit together. Receiver, we know, is the big position. I just thought, let's get that out of the way. And if you look at this, Alan Lazard played 64% of snaps last year. He's going to be on the field. And Randall Cobb played 33% of snaps. 
he's going to be on the field. But a lot of that is he was hurt for a month. He was um, getting integrated into the offense. But he was he was consistently not you know getting below 50%, even when he was out there. So they rotate and are going to continue to rotate receivers. That is clearly the biggest need. So second linebacker, this is the one that keeps coming up because I know the Packer fans, they've got crushes on Nicobe Dean and Devin Lloyd and Chad Muma and Leo Chanel and some of these some of these linebackers in this class. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Packers took a linebacker. I think it's more likely they take a, if you're going to take a Wisconsin linebacker, Jack Sanborn in the fifth because he can be a special teams player and you're not investing much in that spot. That being said, this surprised me when I went back and looked at it. Chris Barnes played almost 49% of snaps last year. And when I went back and looked at the games where he was actually out there and playing, because he was, remember, he was hurt, inactive against Pittsburgh, banged up a little bit. You look at his defensive snap percentage. Starting in week eight, in the games that he played, he played 64, 65, 43, 53, 61, 58, 62, 53, 69% of snaps. And then the Detroit Lions game was weird. He played 100%, but he played, you know, um, a lot of the the uh, garbage time reps as well. But then he played 70% of snaps against San Francisco. Now, the 49ers are a unique team because of as the big offense that they run. But... He also played 61% of snaps against the Rams. He played 69% against the Vikings. He played 64% against the Cardinals, 65% against Kansas City. If the Packers want to play these nickel, these, these sort of true nickels, where you have two interior defensive players, two edge players, and two linebackers, and then five true defensive backs, then... Chris Barnes is going to be on the field a lot, or that second linebacker is going to be on the field a lot. Now, I I happen to think Chris Barnes is someone who played, he had an up and down season, but there was there were games where he played really well. I think you can justify saying, take someone, but not first round take someone, because Devondre Campbell is going to be the guy that plays 100% of snaps. He's the Adrian Amos of this defense aside from Adrian Amos, he's going to play all the snaps. And so even if you want to play nickel, real nickel, I don't, you're still going to play 20% dime. So, or, you know, that's what Joe Barry wants to do. 15, 20%. So you're, you're not getting the same ROI there as, as some other places and at the other places. And I think this is crucial there really isn't a pathway to becoming a starter. So when we look at edge, Jonathan Garvin played 36.6% of snaps last year, 37% basically. Rashawn Gary was right in that mix early in his career when he was third to Preston Smith and Zadarius Smith, 35 to 40%. That's pretty standard. But in two years, you might be a starter. If you draft Devin Lloyd, He's sitting behind Devondre Campbell. Devondre Campbell is going to be a Packer for three, four years. Barring injury, barring craziness. Devondre Campbell is a really good player who has found his role in Green Bay. There's not really a pathway to him being an 80% of snaps player at a position where you want 80% of snaps, like an edge or like a safety or like a receiver. So to me, you have to elevate that need above the linebacker spot. Safety is also an interesting one because if you go back and look, Henry Black paid 24% of defensive snaps. If you go back and look at the end of the season when Kevin King was playing that dime safety linebacker spot, he was playing in that 20% of snap range. If you want to play that true nickel, that, that third safety that shrinks down your priority list, right? But you might need a real guy. You might need a starter in a year. So that, I think, has to go above your inside linebacker spot. Defensive line. 
this raises an interesting question about what the Packers view Jerron Reed's role to be. Is he just going to be another rotational defensive lineman? If you look at, so for the season, Kingsley Kiki paid about 36% of snaps. But when he was out there, out there, when he was healthy and playing, he was consistently playing about 50% of snaps. And even when things were going kind of haywire for him at the end of the year, he played 50, 52, 61, and 64% of the snaps against Minnesota, LA, Chicago, and Baltimore. That's real playing time next to Kenny Clark. Is that going to be Jerron Reed? Tyler Lancaster played about 30% and TJ Slayton played about 24%. You assume Slayton is going to get some work, maybe a little more work. So what are you getting from a defensive lineman that you draft? Dean Lowry, what is he giving you? So, you know, Dean Lowry right now, you know, if I know that it doesn't make everyone happy, still on the team. He's going to get a lot of work. He got 62.5% of snaps last year. Those are going to be the two guys that are on the field the most. Now, if you draft Travis Jones in the first round, He has a chance to eat into that. Dean Lowry not going to be on the field beyond this season probably. And Jerron Reed is on a first year or a one-year deal. So if you do take someone in the first round, they may be on the field 65% of snaps a year from now. Again, now we see the value of looking into the future in addition to right now. So the, the linebacker one, while surprising... It's still the case that that is a part-time player. Now, if you're going to play more than 50% of snaps, I guess that's not quite true. But you're still talking about a guy that you're going to take off the field 30%, 40% of the time. Whereas, again, add rusher, 80%. Safety, 100%. Defensive tackle, 65 70%. They're going to be on the field more. We can argue over, you know, defensive tackle versus linebacker, who's more valuable. If you're the second linebacker, how valuable are you relative to being the second interior defensive lineman? Kind of silly to parse those. I I think it will reflect how they want to play. You know, if you see them take a linebacker early, you're going to probably see them play a lot of two linebacker sets. True nickel. Because it's going to be nickel. So it's going to be Kenny Clark, another defensive lineman, two edge players, and your two inside linebackers. And then your safeties plus your nickel corner, whoever that is, and however they want to align. You'd like to get someone that can be a little bit more versatile than what Chris Barnes can, but however they want to do it. So I I understand that you, you see that and you go, okay, that's a lot of playing time again capped by the fact that they're they're probably not going to be an 80, 90, 100% of snaps player, whereas these other spots are, and especially in the case of edge and safety, they're going to be impact and in this defense, premium positions for the Green Bay Packers. All right, we're going to get to Austin Gale right after this. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one sp- source for all of your betting stats and sports info. Bet on the latest sports developments, league reviews, news, including you'll find all of that at Bet Online. Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information for live betting. If you could bet on some of that stuff, I mean, people would. I guarantee you, people would. If you could put lines on. How bad will Adam Schefter's next tweet be? How insensitive will it be? I'd bet on it. I probably would. Head to the website or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. And thanks for making Locked on Packers your first listen every day. Now for a big announcement. Starting Thursday, April 28th, tune into Locked on NFL Drafts live coverage of the 2022 NFL Draft. All three days of real-time analysis from our extensive lineup of experts and insiders. And for those of you dying to know who your team will take, catch Odyssey and Locked On NFL's Mock Draft Special hosted by Brian Peacock and former scout Matt Williamson of the Peacock and Williamson NFL Show all leading up to the first pick. Locked On NFL Draft live on the Locked On NFL Draft YouTube page. The Odyssey NFL Mock Draft 
the Odyssey and Locked On NFL Draft podcast feeds. These are coming up for you. The week of the draft and the mock draft starts April 28th through the 22nd. Joining me now from Pro Football Focus, you may have seen him on Good Morning Football. He is the mustache of Packers Draft Twitter, Austin Gale. Austin, great to be with you, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So do you accept that title, the mustache of, of Draft Twitter? I think that's right. I, I think that's that works for me, man. I'll take the mustache of I Draft Twitter. I think you got the best one. I really do. Giovanni Bernard used to have the best mustache in Cincy, but I think I've taken over now that he has left and on to Tampa Bay. That's a big title, but I, you know, I think you 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 carry it with with honor and, and pride, and, and I appreciate that about you. Uh, let let's talk NFL draft. Uh, we had we had your your colleague Trevor Sycamore last week talking receivers, and the thing that I love about this is I feel like I can ask you your takes on receivers because you might have like an entirely different group of one through fives than he did just because like, that's the way that this receiver group is. Yeah. But let's start big picture here. What is just your general, like, this is a good class, a great class, an okay class, a top heavy class. Like how would you, what kind of modifier would you use to describe this class? I think it's a good class. I think I, I, I wouldn't say it's as good as last year's. I don't think it has the blue chip talent of last year's class. I don't think I take any of the receivers this year over Devante Smith, Jalen Waddle and Jamar Chase. I, I think there's a lot of high-end wide receiver twos, right? And I think they're getting moved up in this draft class because there are you know, high-end wide receiver twos in the NFL have a ton of value, right? Yeah. I mean, you look at how important playmakers are in the NFL now compared to five years ago. It's insane, right? You The Rams went out and got Odo Beckham Jr. when Robert Woods was healthy and Cooper Cup was on his way to a triple crown, right? They knew right. they needed to continue to add playmakers the Bengals the other Super Bowl team with Tyler Boyd T Higgins and Jamar Chase the best teams in the NFL don't have one playmaker they have multiple playmakers two three plus going back to the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl win they weren't starting Byron Pringle the outside receiver they were starting Sammy Watkins or Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey you know the best teams in the NFL these days have multiple receivers so when you're looking at a high-end wide receiver too those are really really valuable and it's a big reason why I think you could see you know, six plus receivers go in the first round, even though it's not an elite class with a ton of blue chip talent at the position. It's still a very good class with a lot of high end wide receiver twos. So when you're talking about, okay, I think I see these guys as high end wide receiver twos. Are you talking about like 5% to 95% expectation ranges? Or are you talking about if these guys max out, I don't think any of them can be like that true alpha X one. I, I think Drake London could. I think Garrett Wilson could. Olave, maybe Jamison Williams. I'm not there with Traylon Burks, but I think it's low percentage. I, okay. I, I do think it's low percentage for all those guys. Now, Drake London was a legit wide receiver one in the USC offense this past year before breaking his leg, but other receivers haven't been, right? Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave weren't even the most talented receivers on that team with Jack <laughs> with the Jigba. And then Jamison Williams, you only have like one, you know, one year of that alpha experience even then he played a lot in the slot and all that stuff which is which is interesting so i i do think that jameson williams could be a wide receiver one in terms of receiving yardage volume but i don't think he's going to be a target wide receiver one right he's not a 10 15 plus type of target guy like a Devontae adams would be or jamar chase can be or waddle Devontae smith etc so i do think that low percentage chance any of the top end guys become wide receiver ones but high percentage chance london settles as a legit wide receiver two in an offense same with olave same with wilson and i, I agree with jameson williams there as well so before the Devontae adams trade there were a lot of packer fans that had become enamored with chris olave and i think they were looking at this draft and going okay find a legit receiver to someone who can come in right away and compete and olave measures that to a t right that is how he profiles and now that they don't have Devontae adams if you were advising Brian Gutekunst, mm -hmm. how, if at all, would you change your strategy? Would you suddenly go, well, let me try and chase some upside here. Let me see, like, maybe I would rather have George Pickens because there's this 5% chance he becomes, you know, this, this high level receiver or, or, or trade up for Drake and then something like that. Like, how do you think the Adams trade changes the way that the Packers should approach the types of receivers that they target in this draft? I, I'm one, I'm taking Olave over Pickens 10 times out of 10. I, I think Olave is the number two receiver in this class. I'm mm. so high on Olave. And I think the Green Bay Packers would be smart to lock into you know, one of the top four or five receivers in this class. Right now I have it, Drake London, Chris Olave, Jamison Williams, one, two, and three, and in that tier one. And then tier two is Garrett Wilson, Traylon Burks, Sky Moore, and George Pickens in that order, right? I think Sky Moore, George Pickens is the bottom of the barrel in terms of the first round caliber type of guy. Sky Moore, I think could be more of a top of day two player, same with George Pickens. I think the first five will go in the first round. Drake London, Chris Olave, Williams, and Garrett Wilson. Now, for the Packers, 
I, I don't think they can get specific here, right? Obviously, they have a type of receiver. They're like bigger guys, like guys with big catch radiuses, all that stuff. But don't just go get a guy that can produce. Go guy, go get a guy that can get open. I think that's why I think Olave is probably my favorite of the realistic scenarios where a guy can get in. What do you think? Because I've seen a lot of um, the people who study the draft in on the media side. Um, I certainly fall into this realm where I'm not as high on Garrett Wilson as the, the NFL seems to be from talking to, to, to people who know the NFL loves this guy. So where do you think either they're getting it wrong or what do you think from your perspective would hold him back from being that, that Stefan Diggs type, who is the, the name that you hear from, from the people who love him as his best NFL comp. Yeah, with Wilson, I think it's the size, right? He's what five foot 11 and three fours call him six foot one eighty three. And when you look at the Diggs comparison, I think wide receiver weight is so important, right? Mm -hmm. And, Diggs was six foot one ninety five coming out, an extra ten pounds. Also had um, you know similar arm length too. But the Diggs comparison, I think Diggs was more efficient with his feet coming out of Maryland. He's definitely more efficient with his feet now. Garrett Wilson, I think, can afford to dance and freelance a lot more on his routes because he is very dynamic and great after the catch. But slider frame uh, and similar arm length, which is in the concerning tier of like under thirty two, which like or thirty two or under, which I don't love. Right? I think I always want receivers 32, 32 thirty two and a half plus inch arms. It's super important. You know, PFF's uh, Eric Eager has found arm length being mightily important to outside receiver success. And with Wilson, there's maybe some concerns about getting off press and all that stuff. I don't know. I, I think with Garrett Wilson, it's not – the Stephon Diggs comparisons I think are insane. I think what he can be <laughs> in the NFL is Emmanuel Sanders. I think Emmanuel mm -hmm. Sanders, from a productivity standpoint, is what he could get to be. Emmanuel Sanders, great foot fire, but was really efficient with his feet towards the middle of his career, and I thought was wildly successful. And like I don't think that's a knock on Garrett Wilson at all. I think Garrett Wilson can be wildly successful in a wide receiver two role, like a thousand plus, you know, eleven hundred plus you know, receiving yards type of receiver. But he's not a Stephon Diggs. Some people, I've, I mean, he's been compared to Julio Jones in this class, right? Like I mean, I've seen some things made insane comparisons for Garrett Wilson. I'm confident he's going to be. You know, a really good player. Now, I, I, am I concerned about the weight? Sure. I also think that like some of the 40 time stuff, he's he tested faster than what I saw, at least from yeah. a long speed perspective. Um, I, I, I have him as my wide receiver four, right? In that second tier of receiver. So I'm kind of with you in that I'm not as high on him. I think Daniel Jeremiah has him as a top five player. My co-host on the tailgate podcast, Mike Renner sees him as the number one receiver or number two receiver in this class. I'm with you though, that he's more of the wide receiver three, wide receiver four range for me, middle of the middle, middle first round type of guy. Friend of the show, Mike Renner. Uh, love that. Uh, and, and we're going to hopefully get him on next week as well. Christian Watson is a name that has come up a lot uh, among, among Packers fans because the athletic tools, they jump out. The testing numbers were unbelievable at 6'4 plus, 200 plus to move the way that he does. And you see it on tape. He moves effortlessly for someone his size. The question is, when can he play receiver in the NFL? And the answer might be like 2023 at the earliest. So how do you value someone like that who is this incredible outlier athlete who needs a ton of polish, a ton of seasoning, and is trying to make this leap in competition from North Dakota state where he's playing FCS competition to now in the NFL. I mean, I think I gained a lot of respect, not respect. I think I gained a lot of really good perspective on Christian Watson talking to his head coach at North Dakota state, Matt Entz. He was on our podcast today. And you know, he said, this is a guy that came in as a raw, explosive, insane athlete for his size that worked every day to be a better receiver. He was a captain early on in his career at North Dakota state. And really you saw kind of the fruits of his labor this past season and, you know, the target share and all that kind of stuff. He still said though, he needs to work the jugs machine. He needs to get better with his hands. He needs to attack the ball better. His ball skills can always improve. He needs, but for a guy, for a guy his size to be as explosive as he is, to be able to sink into his hips, that's evident in his three cone and the change of direction stuff. Like that's just one of, you know, that's really rare talent, rare athleticism, rare measurables that you bet on. And when you can bet on trajectory and work ethic and someone that's been counted on at North Dakota state and improved over the course of his career. And that has a lot of support of his teammates and the captain status and the support of his head coach. I mean, that's a prospect project really i'm willing to buy into am i buying into it over guys that have already produced and have maybe not similar athletic testing but still like plus athletic testing no like i don't have watson ahead of a lot of guys on my receiver list really i mean i, I feel more confident in, in guys that have produced at a high level right now christian watson is wide receiver 12 for me i comped him to chris conley and that chris conley was this big insane athlete as well yep. but the ball skills just weren't there yet right i'd rather have 
Jahan Dotson, Alec Pierce, who has really a lot better ball skills than Chris Conley does, and he's explosive in his own right. Justin Ross, Jalen Tolbert are other ones I have ahead of him. It speaks to how good this receiving class is too, right? Christian Watson as your wide receiver 12. Sounds like you're low on him, but I still think he's a top 50 player, top 65 player, where other times, other receiving classes, you get to wide receiver 12 is a lot lower. Let's transition to a position that we, we probably have not spent enough time talking about on this show. I know it has not gotten enough ink on Packers Twitter, and that's safety. I think this is a really fun, really interesting safety class. And I think a couple names that I've been hearing are, are, are you know, potentially going to sneak into the first round. Lewis Seen from Georgia and Daxton Hill from Michigan, guys that I think Green Bay could be interested there. They have taken safeties in the first round, in fact, twice over the last eight years. Um, so what do you think of those guys as prospects? I missed it. What position did you say? Safety. Safety. I think the safety the safety class is like really underrated. There's a lot of top end talent in this safety class, specifically guys at the back end of the first round, top of the second round is where I think you could see a run on safeties. Cause I do think there is a drop off at the position somewhat guys that you can kind of see coming in immediately as starters. I still think Kyle Hamilton ultimately is a top 13 pick. I think it'd be crazy to see him get past Houston at 13. And then at the top of the second round, maybe back end of the first Lewis scene of Georgia. I'm really impressed with. I still really like Jaquan Brisker. Nick cross of Maryland is one of my favorites. And then after that, you're betting more on projects, right? Tyson Anderson is probably my favorite project type safety coming out of Toledo this year, a really crazy athlete. Um, Jalen Petrie is someone I didn't even mention, played a lot in the slot this past year for Baylor, but probably best projects as a safety in the NFL, really explosive player, tenacious player, highest graded run defending slot cornerback this past year in all of college football. Wow. Really good safety class. If you want a starter, you're going to either need to get Kyle Hamilton in the top 15 picks or probably in the top 50 that – you know, back in, you know, top of the second round where a lot of these guys are going to come off. Lewis Seen, Jalen Petrie, Jaquan Brisker, Nick Cross. I expect all those guys off the board by pick 50. So let's say I order, the, and let's not say, I'm saying, I order the Packers needs receiver, safety, edge, offensive line. That's probably where I, I think I would go. If you're, you got, they've got 22, 28, 53, 58. If you're just going to put together a, this is where I think the best positional value, if you want to address those four positions, is going to be in this draft. Slot those for me. That is interesting. I do think they're in a really good spot for receiver, right? I, I think receiver makes a ton of sense for the Packers at the, you know, with their first pick in the first round and their second pick in the first round, right? And then obviously with the 53-59, they can make some waves there as well. I think 53-59 is where I look at offensive line. I think this is a really good interior offensive line class. There might be even some tackle co guard converts that you can grab at 53-59 that can improve that offensive line. Um, and then for edge – 53 and 59 is probably where I lean as well. I don't think I like edge in the 22 or 28 spots. Depends on how high you are on Boye Mafe, how far Jermaine Johnson falls. Um, then you could start to get interested. But then you look at in the 50 and 59 range, you can get a guy like Nick Benito out of Oklahoma where I'm more comfortable. Arnold Ebichetti at 28 is probably the highest. I'd probably take him out of Penn State. But going receiver at 22 – you know, your favorite of that group, if a Jamison Williams falls, if Olave falls, one of these guys will be available. Traylon Burke, Sky Moore, George Pickens. I think you can get really good value at 22 with the receiver. Then at 28, I think you're more often looking at maybe edge. Again, it's Boye Mafe, Arnold Nebuchetti that you're looking at that. And then into your offensive line is where I lean at 53 and 59, going and getting guys like Dylan Parham and, um, you know, Kenyon Green at Texas A&M, I think is going to fall a bit after bad athletic testing. That's probably where I'd slot those groups. I keep saying 58. It's 59. I don't know why it's in my brain is 58, but it's 59. Thank you for correcting me. Oh, cool. um, you mentioned the edge class um, and we, we didn't get a chance to talk about that. I, I watched them over the weekend and came away going, who am I supposed to be really impressed with in this class? It feels like a lot of projection, a lot of guys who have great athletic tools, but did not produce at a, at a, at a college level before we actually do the, who do you like, who do you like? You guys have done a lot of studies at PFF about what is translatable on the edge. What are the things that you're looking for from a data standpoint, whether it's your numbers or the raw numbers on what works in the NFL from the college game? Length, change of direction, ability, and explosiveness. I mean, those are the three like biggest things. And a lot of that's obviously measurables focus, athletic testing focus, but you need guys with great short shuttle, three cone times, the broad jump, the vertical jump, 10 yard split. And then arm length, you need length, you need size at, at that position to, to have like high ceiling projections, right? Are there guys with shorter arms that have success in the NFL? Absolutely. Are there guys that maybe don't have elite three cones, but you'll find ways to produce? Sure. But if you want first round caliber type of edge talent, 
you're going to need guys that are legitimate athletes. That's why I think Epichetti is going to get talked about. Boye Mafe is going to get talked about. Um, George Karloftis is slipping for whatever reason, but that's another really good athlete for a guy his size. His three cone I thought was impressive. Um, a really good weight to be inside, outside vers versatile. I think he could play three, four defensive end. He could play on the edge if he wanted to. Um, he could play even head up on the guards. <laughs> that's how that's how like kind of explosive he is in his lower half. He's a former what Greek. U14 water polo player, mm -hmm. national water polo player. So I like Carl Loftus too. If he falls that far, say at 22, 23, I mean, that's a really good spot for Carl Loftus as well if you're going to start to prioritize edge talent. And then I, I agree with you. I think the best pro producers in this class are at the top Thibodeau, Hutchinson. Um, I wouldn't even say Jermaine Johnson. Jermaine Johnson ranks outside the you know, top 50 in pass rush win rate this past year. People are raving about him for the tools and what he did at the Senior Bowl, but I was unimpressed with what he did at Florida State, right? He never really put it all together consistently at Florida State. I'm more concerned on his production than I am some others in this class. But Carl Loftus, Hutchinson, Thibodeau are all really good producers. Kingsley and Agbury, phenomenal producer, but doesn't have a lot of those things that I said translate, right? He's got the length. But the three cone, the the 40 is not great. The athletic testing for an agri is a damn shame because he's a really good football player and someone that, you know, South Carolina talks really highly of, but probably fits best now in that like day two, top of day three would be insane for someone as productive as he was in college. But maybe just you're betting on athletic testing, you know, going into the NFL. I don't think it's talked about enough how, you know, it's it's like 0.001% of the best athletes in the world that play at the, in the NFL at the size that they are. So you have to be in that tier to really, really be really be productive and produce. So those top 100 picks are spent on guys that have that ceiling. This is a difficult question for you to answer because you are not in charge of everyone. But I look at someone like Trayvon Walker and I go, I don't know, what's, what's really the difference between what we saw from him in college, how he tested, and someone like Rashawn Gary. Rashawn mm -hmm. Gary was... Didn't like the pick at the time. I was wrong, but was universally declared a bust at 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, your colleague, Steve Palazzolo, wrote for PFF, like, don't draft for Sean Gary, basically. Yeah. Um, and now Trayvon Walker is a lock top five potential number one overall kind of player. So I guess I'm going to ask you this, it, it this way. How much do you think someone like Rashawn Gary, Daniel Hunter, guys like that affect the way we view someone like Trayvon Walker, even just a couple years later? I, I might have a bold take here, but I would say not at all. I, mm. I think what, what affects it is the testing. Like if you test like a freak athlete, you are going to go high. It is something that the side, the height, weight, speed has been baked. It's like establishing the run for evaluators. Honestly, <laughs> that like it's, it, it's that, it matters that much. And I'm not saying it. I, I'm saying it matters to them that much. And I'm not even saying that the data discredits like how important it is. Like the data oftentimes does back up. Being an elite athlete, elite caliber athlete has a lot of success. The data, however, would probably suggest that entering a threshold puts you in this tier, right? It's not like the faster he is, the more athletic he is, the more explosive he is, he's just going to be a better player. And I think that's where it gets kind of wrongly portrayed in the media, right? So he got this good of a three cone, this good of a 40 yard dash. He's this big, he's this size, all these like maximum things. It's like, no, it's more important that if you're an elite tiered athlete, you enter this tier of outcomes compared to a low tiered athlete. And that tier of outcomes ranges, right? You know, it ranges to the Rashawn Gary levels and all that stuff. Um, just depending on like how productive you are in college. And I think I'm more worried, you know, people bring up, people bring up all the time with Walker. It's like the production, the production, you know, throw the production stuff a little bit out the window. How he was used at Georgia is so different than how he was used. Was how Aiden Hutchinson was used and all that stuff. They wanted him to stop the run every play, stop the run, head up on the tackle, sometimes even inside the tackles, and not a lot of career snaps playing purely on the edge. He also just did pin his ears back. You, know, you look at some of his like true pass rush opportunities against Evan Neal and some of these top offense tackles. Oftentimes he's you know not looking to win with an outside move. He doesn't have two way goes, right? I think that I don't, I'm not I'm less concerned with his production as much as I'm concerned with he just hasn't played the position you're going to ask him to play a lot, right? Like I mean, like if you're going to ask him to be a stand up, you know, outside linebacker in a three four defense, he just hasn't done it. He's done it a third of the amount of times in his college career as Aiden Hutchinson has. You know, if you're going to ask him to do that, it's projection. That's what you're projecting. I think the other piece of it too, is I disagree with is that he's a low floor player. That's not true. Like he is so athletic and in this tier of elite athleticism that if you do play him in the same role that he played at Georgia, I think he could be a really productive run defender and have success in that regard. So I, I don't think he should be billed as this like boomer bust type of player. I think it's more that like, Hey, what he could be is sick. And what he what he probably end up being though is it, or not what he'll probably end up being, but his worst is probably a really good run defender, but never really affects the pass. You know, at least not early on in his career. 
that was exactly how I would have described Rashawn Gary coming out. So that makes a lot of sense that that those two. I mean, I've seen the Rashawn Gary comps now, and it's just it's just interesting to me from someone who went through the process with it, saw the Rashawn Gary pick, reacted to it the way that I did, and then we see the, the outcome. Yeah. Um, it, it's just. I, mean, I don't think I don't think Trayvon Walker and like the. I don't think it's that dissimilar to the Malik Willis conversation. Like mm. Malik Willis is elite athlete, great arm, howitzer of an arm could, you know, break, you know, force missed tackles and uh, all this stuff. And like, you're like obsessed with the tools, but like, hasn't played a lot of good football. Like right. I mean, you're, looking, you're looking for him and you could, you know, for the same, you're like, Oh, well he wasn't played in the right position for Malik Willis. It's like, well, his offensive line was terrible. It's like, you can make all these excuses. That's not what that's for. You know, when you talk to evaluators in the NFL, it's about mitigating risk. Mitigating risk is mean mi mitigating projection with Willis. You're going to have to project him behind a better offensive line, project him in an NFL offense because they don't run that at Liberty. And those are things that are pause or reason for concern. With Walker, it's the very same way, right? Oh, my God, the tools are insane. What he could do is absolutely insane, but we haven't seen it yet. And uh, we'll, see if it, we'll see if he can actually put it all together. Very glad that the, the Packers are probably not going to be in the mix for a quarterback in this draft, although I have been wrong before about that. So we will see. Austin, let my audience know where they can find more of the stuff that you're doing. Yeah, definitely check out the Tailgate Podcast. It's where, available wherever you find your podcast. I'm also working on a release of Hutch. It's a four-part podcast series with Aiden Hutchinson. It comes out on Wednesday, April 13th. Uh, a lot of work went into that. We are super excited to release it here at PFF. And you can obviously follow me on Twitter at PFF underscore Austin Gale and check out PFF at PFF.com. Awesome. Thanks, Austin. All right. I want to thank Austin again for joining the show. Great to talk to him. Really, the mustache really is great. It really is triumphant is is the only word truly to describe it. If you're if you're not watching us on YouTube, why? But also thank you if you are. Uh, and thanks to our sponsors for today's episode, Rock Auto. With the ever increasing number of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. So why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brands their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pockets. So I don't know what I'm supposed to be spending, but you can trust at Rock Auto, it's going to be the lowest price. Why spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? Did you know that some Auto parts stores have different prices for professionals relative to do-it-yourselfers. If I went in to buy something, it would be a different price for me than someone who fixes cars for a living. What? Did you did you know that? That's craziness. Not at Rock Auto. Same prices are low for everyone. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck and write locked on in there. How did you hear about us box? So they know we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. And thanks for making Locked On Packers your first listen every day. Now go make your second listen, Locked On NFL Draft. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL Draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. We are getting some news about some makeup pro days that I just want to flag for you guys. Um, Drake London from USC pushed his pro day back. Um, hopefully that is going to be this week. We will see. But he's coming off a pretty serious leg injury. So he's trying to make sure that that he's back to 100% and able to be trained and, and, and do all this stuff. If he can't or does not test well, it might push him down the boards where Green Bay might have a chance to actually draft him. Otherwise, right now, I don't I don't see him making it to 22. Could the Packers want to trade up if he tests really well? Potentially something to keep an eye on there. Plus, when you look at the, the things that the Packers traditionally like, the size-speed combination, there are some players that haven't really been talked much about, haven't gotten a lot of hype because they didn't test. The combine is always this... Um, in some ways, it's a ridiculous thing that we get these guys and they come in and you go, oh my God, did you see that guy? And then that helps their stock. It affects their stock. And the guys that don't test, they can often get lost in the shuffle. And I, I don't know that that is, is really useful for us because we want to know who the best player is. 
And so when you have someone like Romeo Dobbs from Nevada who hasn't tested, he can get lost in the shuffle. But he checks the statistical boxes that I like to see. Breakout age, college dominator. He was one of the fastest players at the Senior Bowl. And now he gets a chance to work out this week for NFL teams. He could suddenly be right back on the radar. He can fly. You want height, weight, speed? How about 6'2", 200? He's probably going to run low 4'4s, high 4'3s. He is that fast. Could be someone that the Packers, if they can get you know, a bigger body early or they can get someone who works the middle of the field, the underneath early, someone like Traylon Burks, for example, maybe you get a speedster to make the geometry fit, someone who can take the top off, someone like Romeo Dobbs. Um, his, his highlights are spectacular. I have not had a chance to really dig into his tape yet. That is on my agenda. Um, so just, just wanted to get those on your radar as we approach the end of NFL draft season and get ready for the actual NFL draft. All right, follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to hit us up on the Locked on Packers fan hotline, you can do that, 920-341-3775. To stay, Locked on Packers.